Well, good morning and happy Friday to everyone. I hope you've had a good inbound 16 thus far. Appreciate you making this session. When we get our slides queued up here, we'll, we'll get started. As it's getting queued up, for, before I get into the meat of the presentation, I, the first slide I'm gonna show you is some additional resources if you're interested in diving further into neuromarketing. Oftentimes people ask me, you know, how do you dive, or what, what resources do you recommend to learn more about this? I won't be able to cover everything in a 45 minute session, so the first slide I'm gonna show you, so if you're interested, you can take a picture, it will just be some, some books that I'm gonna recommend. If you're interested in diving more into the neuromarketing, so a couple books, I would rec few books I'd recommend is Decoding the New Consumer Mind, The Buying Brain, Biology, three good books, and then a website, braintrust101.com. Great resources and topics on this. So that's what some of this is based on today. So as we look at the agenda, and you may have noticed in, in the title of my uh, session that I'm using alliteration, where we're really playing off the word S. And there's a little brain science trick for you that if you can use alliteration and you can use things like acronyms, it really helps with, with memory recall. And really, I just wanted to tee this up because you can see all the S's here and that just tees up my next slide. Where if we had the luxury and the financial means to have all of us in this room hooked up with brain monitors and brain activity monitors, what we would see is that when we're looking at the Superman logo, it's more than just looking at an S. There's color theory going on, it's the implications that we have with color theory, as well as there's all this emotional and these memories that come back that may be from when you saw the movie, maybe there's a memory as a, as a childhood for me going to the movie with my parents, or a scene in the movie that resonates with you, but also there's the, the characteristics of Superman himself, the character that are implied within this logo. So we're talking about strength, speed, good looks, all those things that are associated with the Superman icon. Right? And that will subconsciously affect how we behave in our actions. So our subconscious has a bit, plays a bigger role than any of us might think in our actions and our behaviors. And I'm gonna show that to you later in the presentation. Now, I've always been interested in superheroes as a kid. One was being an artist and I always liked drawing. I always liked the superhero artwork, right? So that was one reason. But the other one was I truly wanted to be Superman as a child. My parents were very supportive. My mom would always say, you guys can be whatever you want to be in life as long as you work hard and commit to it. And I thought, well, if I'm going to work hard, I might as well go for the best, right? I want to be Superman. And I figured out how I was going to fly. In addition to being supportive, she would say things and be like, Jeff, you know, you're really special and there's no one else in this world just like you. Which was ironic because I have a twin brother. So, <laughs> so I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed either. Didn't figure that out until I was 40. And I, maybe I'm not so special. And we also see this in personality tests. So just a show of hands of people who have ever taken a personality test, like a Myers-Briggs Strength Finder 2.0. Okay, yeah, so what I'm showing here is the Fascination Advantage Test. And we took this in our office, and it was a fun activity, and I'm not here to debate whether one's more accurate than the other. It's just we took the Fascination Advantage Test. But what's interesting is that I got a report back that you would have swore somebody was following me for the 40 years on Earth. I mean, this report was so detailed to me and what I have highlighted here in yellow is that I only had to answer 28 questions. So I answered 28 questions and they could spit out a report that sounded it was like just made for me. So it must tell you that we're not nearly as special as we think. It comes down to also as human beings we are hardwired to survive. We are hardwired to protect ourselves. It doesn't mean we're selfish and mean, it just means that's how we're made. And we need to leverage this in our marketing and our communications. So when we take a look at basic human needs, the number one is our physiological needs. And I'm not gonna dive into these in too much detail, but all I'm gonna say is your physiological needs are just about survival, about eating, getting sleep, all the way if you work down the scale to self-actualization. Well, I can tell you if I'm being chased by a tiger, I'm not worried about my self-esteem or my self-actualization. I just don't wanna be lunch, right? Or if I'm on an island and I'm hungry, I'm just worried about my physiological needs. Those always come first and then we work through to other basic needs. Now, if we look at a diagram of the brain, I'm gonna make it in a, the simplest uh, version I can here. If we look at this diagram, let's just break it down into three parts. The outer part, labeled three here, is really about our rational thinking. As we move our way in, is, what's labeled two in the diagram is really about our emotions and feelings. And then what's labeled one in this diagram is the core of our brain, it's our primitive brain. It's really about fight or flight and survival. Now we need to be talking to the buying brain in any of our sales and marketing communications. We need to build trust, right? We have to let that primitive part of our brain know that, hey, this person isn't here to take advantage of me, they're not here to harm me, because then you're more receptive to messaging. 
we have to make an emotional connection. Then we work our way into area two of the brain where we're talking to emotions and feelings. We need emotional connection. And then, and only then, will people listen to your rational discussions. It's not a surprise that we all know that people like to do business with those they know, like, and trust. Right? That's not a surprise to any of us. But yet when we talk to people in our sales and our marketing messages, a lot of times we're coming, hey, look what we can do and look at our offerings and our product. We made no attempt to make a personal connection or to get them to let their guard down in any way. And we've probably seen this where you've, come, you've talked to somebody who's overly salesy, and the first thing you do, you kind of step back and like, whoa, and you find yourself you're more reserved. You're not going to let that person in. Same thing. We need to be speaking to the buying brain. Now, in addition to being hardwired to survive, we're also hardwired to, as visual people. You know, 90% of the information coming to us is visual, and we process visuals 60,000 times faster than text, which is why you can see like, things like infographics were so important. It's why social media, other than the voyeuristic nature of it, is it's visuals. When you look at Instagram, Pinterest, it's a visual experience, and we love that as human beings. If you don't believe me, look at how we communicate with each other. You know, this is like a sample text to my wife. We don't even say anything anymore. It's just like, thumbs up, love you, smooches, all that kind of crap, right? <laughs> I even just, for purpose of showing this, my phone doesn't even want me to type words. I just started fictitiously typing in happy birthday, Connie, have a great day. It wants me to replace happy birthday with the, the birthday cake emoji. And it wants me to replace great with a smiley face. So I'm not saying you go into your boardroom the next time and you present with nothing but emojis. That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is if this is how we really communicate in the real world, then we might want to think about that in our, our marketing and in our messaging. So maybe a 40-page proposal isn't the way to go. Maybe we need to shorten it up, make it more of a visual experience. And better yet, how do we incorporate video to create that human interaction? Now we heard Gary Vaynerchuk in his opening keynote for Inbound 16 talk about the importance of video. He talked about Facebook Live being important, and I would definitely make, if that isn't part of your strategy moving forward, it should be. But video is a great way to speak to that buying brain. It makes a human connection. And we can see that executives are using it and sharing it with colleagues to make purchase decisions. The best example, it's an old one. I'm sure most of you have seen it, but the blend tech example with the Will It Blend, just a show of hands, just so I get a sense of how many people have seen this. Okay, for those in the room, the, the quick story is they sell industrial and commercial grade blenders. Um, and in this series, what they're doing is taking different things and they're dropping it in their blender and pureeing it to dust. So they take things like an iPhone, an iPad, drop it in the blender, puree it to dust, and they kind of do it in a fun way, like a 60s or 70s game show. And the gentleman that you're seeing on screen is their founder. So they could have went the traditional route. They could have done a traditional television spot or an advertising spot, but no one would have cared, right? It could have been the most beautiful beach with the most beautiful couple, and in the background you see their their blender's making thousands of margaritas and everybody's in love and it's great. That's crap, right? Nobody would share that stuff. Instead, they, they drop an iPhone and they blend it and we've got, in this case, an iPad. They've got over 18 million people that viewed this. So people are sharing it because they're entertained. And that's a great way to get people to trust you and to let their guard down. People like to laugh, they like to be entertained. And if you can do that, you're slowly opening it up to be more receptive to your message. And they did a great thing here. The arrow that you're seeing right here is pony, a call to action, driving back to the relevant information on their website. So a great example. Now, how do you do this in the real world you don't, if you don't have the budget to be setting up a, a blend tech, will it blend set? Well, one of the things we do with our clients is we just simply set up an iPad. So they do, we just have a salesperson that was interested in doing more with his LinkedIn connections. You know, I'm sure a lot of you are on LinkedIn, but maybe you're thinking like, I'm not really active or maybe am I not using it to the best that I could. He was in that same situation. And so we said, well, why don't you reach out to 52 people in your LinkedIn network and we'll do a 52 and 52 interview series. Well, you'll bring in industry subject matter experts. We'll sit you down in the conference room. He wanted to do all of it, so he simply put his iPad on a tripod, recorded it, made some very minor edits with, I, with the iMovie app right on his iPad, uploaded it to YouTube, and then every week he would share a valuable piece of content in a video with his network. And he can attribute to nearly $1 million worth of premium for the agency because of this. And better yet, he was able to drive business to his guests. So you talk about a win-win and that whole relationship about building trust and doing more with your LinkedIn network and that human connection. It doesn't have to be fancy. We are blessed to have phones that have awesome cameras. Take advantage of it. So we've talked about the importance of visuals and video, but words matter too. 
So we can talk about, here's a couple examples. There was an interesting research study done by a group where they brought in two separate groups into two separate rooms and the age was balanced. They had a good mix of young and old folks, right? Group A was primed with words associated with being young and group B was associated with words associated with being old or aging. And what they did, what they were really testing this group on, unbeknownst to them, was by being primed with words, does it physically, does it affect the speed at which you walk? And it did. So those that were primed in that room with words associated with aging, when they, they were measured from that conference room to wherever point B was, and that group walked slower. So if just being presented with words can affect the speed at which we walk, words can definitely affect what we do in a purchase decision. Another example, Another study was done, and we're just talking about it doesn't have to always be visual, but how can we play off the other senses? There was a wine uh, shop that for one week they played French music softly in the background, and then for the following week they played German music in the background. The week that the French music was played, French wine sales went up. And the week that the German music was played in the background, German wine sales went up. And nothing else about the store changed, just subtle music in the background. Last example, two groups again brought in to a room. They thought they were being brought in to do a taste test on a, a new muffin that was going out on the market. What they were really being tested on is, is there's a sense of smell. How does it affect our behavior? So group A was in a room that just smelled like whatever that conference room smelled like, and they ate their muffins. Group B, the room was scented, smelled like lemons. Now group B actually was cleaner. They smelled lemon scent, it, it reminded them of you know, something just being freshly cleaned, and they actually took more care in how they were eating. They cleaned up after themselves. So nothing else changed, just simply a little bit of a fragrance in the air. So my point of telling you this is, don't think that you always need to redo your website, right? Start with small iterations. Start with small things, test a few things, test the length of your content, are you using more bullet points? It doesn't have to be this big redo a strategy, redo your website, start with the little things. All right, so we've been talking a lot about our brains. Let's see how sharp you guys are. Let's see your memory. So if you know who this next character is when I flip the slides, just, just shout it out, okay? E.T. E e e okay, E.T. All right, so that was an easy one. Can anybody tell me what candy was featured in the movie E.T.? Wow, okay, so that took you like a good what, quarter of a second to know that. That is correct. Now, the reason you probably remember that was it was product placement, sure, but the important part, the reason we remember that is because that was an integral part of the movie. That was part of the story. It wasn't just that Reese's Pieces were sitting on the table while Elliot was choking down a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. It was what got E.T. out of the woods and into Elliot's care and into his house. Without the Reese's Pieces, E.T. may still be in that woods and he's still trying to phone home, right? So we remember that because it was a part of the story. Another example, can anybody name the, the manufacturer who makes those sunglasses that Tom Cruise is wearing? Ray-Ban. Ray okay, you guys want to be Maverick, don't you? <laughs> so if you take a look at this, Aviator sunglasses sales rose by 40% in the seven months following Top Gun's release. Now it wasn't just that those sunglasses were on his dashboard, and Tom Cruise doesn't need much help to be hunkalicious, right? He's doing fine on his own. But these sunglasses were an important part of his character. And that reflected people wanted to be Maverick. Now, if you ask these guys that bought these sunglasses after the fact, they'd be like, well, bro, it keeps the sun out of my eyes. No, it's like, bro, you want to be Maverick, and you want to get the chicks. And that's the reality. This character was subconsciously affecting what we're doing and how we're purchasing things. Last example is we look at a more recent example, American Idol. When it first came out, it had three primary sponsors. We had Coke, AT&T, and Ford. AT&T at the time was singular. They did a research study to show like, what was the brand impression? Was their brand lift, better recall after being a sponsor for American Idol? And both Coke and AT&T had, had a brand boost, better recall. Ford actually went down. So can you imagine having to explain that to your boss? Hey, I just spent X millions of dollars and now people remember, remember us less. Well, here's the reason. Coke and AT&T weave their message into the story of the show. Other than the, the obvious product placement in front of the judges, Coke also was said to have used Coca-Cola Red in some of the walls, in, in some of the backgrounds. They had chairs shaped like that resembled Coca-Cola bottles. AT&T 
was very directly part of the show. That was the voting mechanism by which you would vote for your favorite uh, performer. Ford, on the other hand, although their advertising was geared toward their, their target, they did it in a traditional TV spot, slot time slot, which people ignore, right? It's, so Coke and AT&T weaved it into the show. They made an integral part of it, and that's why people remembered it. It's no different than how native advertising can be more effective than banner ads, right? It's that banner blindness versus native advertising where we just work it right into the story. That's important for us to know that. So how do we put this, what's the strategy? How do we put this into practice? I'm gonna show you a couple case studies, some practical examples that hopefully you can get some tips to be able to take back on your own. So the first campaign we did was the, called the Dog Days of Summer, and it was for one of our asphalt paving and manufacturing clients that we've been working with. Now before I dive into it, a show of hands of dog owners in the room. Dog owners? Awesome. And can you keep your hands up if you also own a home? You also own a home. Okay, you're so convenient because I, I, I can only go so far, but, okay. I have to ask you a question, okay? So you said you own a dog and you own a home, and I can only, sorry, I can only get this close. Can't be that personal. So what kind of dog do you have? A cockapoo. Okay, and how old is your dog? Four. And what is your favorite thing about your cockapoo? Um, being outdoors. Okay, being outdoors with him. Now, you also said you own a home, so you have a driveway. Okay, so what kind of driveway do you have? Is it asphalt, concrete, gravel? Concrete. concrete. All right, how old is your driveway? Ten years. Ten years. Okay, I'm surprised you knew. That's awesome. What's your favorite thing about your driveway? Uh, you, you can stop right there. It's, so you see how the creepy factor came into play there? When I was asking her about her dog, it was like, awesome, yeah, I got a cockapoo, and it's like, and your eyes light up, and you're like, probably subconsciously a little flattered, like somebody cares about my dog. I asked her about her driveway, and she's like, security, security. <laughs> Right? Like this creepy guy with the eyebrows is asking me like, crazy questions about my driveway. Why does he need to know? So, but we do that all the time, don't we? We just, hey, let's go talk about our driveway if, we want, if we're an asphalt paving company. So what we did here is we did the Dog Days of Summer where we said, okay, in celebration of Wolf Paving 75 years, we want to partner with community organizations and nonprofits. So we partner with the Wisconsin Humane Society. It has a great reach socially. The folks at Wolf Paving love dogs. They have black labs that wander around their office. So what we did was we put a campaign together to not only celebrate 75 years, but the goal was to drive more email addresses in their CRM to build their contact database. So we started with where people wanted to be. And so what we offered was free strobe collars for dogs. So you could email, you could request a collar that would light up. So you can see in this picture here, down below, folks in the back may not see it, but it's a glowing collar to keep your dog and you safe if you're walking or in early morning or in the evenings. And when we take a look at the creative rationale, like now one thing that Gary V said in his keynote was the importance that creative is gonna play in differentiation. And as a creative firm, we, we totally agree with that. So some of the things that we applied, that we just learned in early in our presentation, how is that applied to our creative? Well, we're building trust. You can see the big heart in there. Okay, it's a symbol that people recognize. And what's more trustworthy than a heart, right? Like, I love you, right? I mean, that's right, how we are building trust. But it's also working up as a framing mechanism for the headline, so it dries your, your eyes in. We keep the headline extremely simple and straightforward. Keep your dog safe, free strobe collar. We even point to what exactly it is. That's a way to build trust with people. If you don't make it confusing, you're eliminating friction. What we did then too is we have a picture of a dog, which will grab people's attention. Eyes are pointed up towards the headline. Eye tracking studies will show that people follow eyes. So you'll connect with eyes, and then oftentimes if you can get eyes looking up at something, we're curious and we follow like, hey, what's, what's that dog looking at? So we, we put that into practice. Now, they came to a landing page, learned more about what the offer was, how we're partnering with the Wisconsin Humane Society. We're also gonna donate a bag of food. So we're again saying, hey, we love the community. We love, the, we love dogs. But now, how does this apply to, to working into the story of people's lives? Well, we are physically giving them something that they are, they're attaching to something they're passionate about. They're attaching it to their dog on that morning walk or that evening walk. So we're associating this brand with something that they truly, truly love. We're also associating ourselves into a time of day that's probably a little bit more peaceful, a little nicer than what it's like at work, right? So instead of sending them an email where well, they're already stressed out, they have too many emails to begin with, we're trying to attach the brand to that early morning walk where maybe that's their only peaceful moment of the day or in the evening they're walking with their significant other, right? So we wanna attach our brand to a moment in their life. 
it was very effective. We had over 500 submissions in three weeks. Again, we only had 500 to give away. But what's important to see, and what I've pointed here, is that 429 of those were new contacts. So what we are going to do with those is we continue to nurture them with emails about pet safety tips. We get partner with local veterinarians to get blog posts. Right? And we start slowly weaving the message from their pet to wolf paving like this. We start off with the pet. We say we're proud to partner with Wisconsin Humane Society. Next emails, we start working saying we're very proud of, of the community that we serve. Oh, by the way, we've been here for 75 years. We actually pave the majority of the roads that you actually drive on. And we slowly work it down towards, if you would ever need our services, we're a business you can trust. So again, like this example here, we didn't just go right talking about the driveway and creep them out and get them to put their guard up. We started with something that they were passionate about and we slowly, patiently worked our way through. Another example here, this was one of our clients, Lakeland Industries, among other things, they manufacture and create firefighter turnout gear. And they were relatively new to this space and they were definitely the smaller player. Didn't have a lot of brand recognition amongst the firefighter community. So that was our goal. How do we create more brand awareness within this community? So we interviewed some uh, firefighters that are in our personal network. So we did our buyer persona interviews. But then we just went on some popular firefighter websites. So like Firefighter Nation, where they are very active. They're posting. They have forums. And we literally just combed through and said, what are the most popular articles on this website? We went into the forums. Who, what topics have the most comments? And we actually just read through the comments like a focus group. And what we found was what one of the big challenges for firefighters is to keep people excited about training. How do you continue to be firefighter fit? And that aligned with Lakeland's message because their turnout gear was really about performance. It was made differently, had stitches and things in different areas that made performance better for firefighters. And obviously, if you're running into a burning building, that's an important thing. But they were having a tough time breaking that market against the bigger competitors. So we tested this out. We said, well, let's put together an ebook with firefighter training tips. So what we did is Lakeland also was sponsoring a few contestants in the Firefighter Combat Challenge. With, if anybody's seen that, it's on, what, they're in their full gear, they'll run upstairs, drag a dummy, and they're timed. Right? So they had a couple contestants in that. And we told that story. We interviewed those contestants, say, how do you stay firefighter fit? And we shared this in this ebook. Now, if we look at the creative rationale of what we did, again, we kept the messaging extremely simple to explain what it is. We used a human being in a dramatic pose, eyes forward. We show a little skin, gets your attention. This guy's ripped. If I want to download an ebook, that's what I want to look like when I'm done reading the ebook. Right? We played up the hashtag gear up to really kind of build on the firefighter's pride. And we can see this in context, too. So this is mocked up of what it looked like when we did, we did a, a a banner ad on Firefighter Nation, didn't cost a ton of money. And what we did is we looked at the website first before we built out the creative. We said, okay, you go to the homepage, you notice a lot of red. So we put a green background to get people's attention. Made a pretty simple headline, get your free guide. Again, if you look at this page, the only real human elements on this is the, the gentleman on the guide, right, looking up at you. And then there's a guy in this picture right here in a boot. Everything else, there's no real human element, and we're, we're hardwired to connect to humans. So we leveraged that to be able to get visibility. Very successful, got over 1,500 visits to our landing page, over 2,700 people downloaded the ebook initially. So that kind of backed our strategy that, yeah, people are interested in that. And what we did is then we continued to nurture them, telling the story of Sean and some of the other competitors. So we weave storytelling into it, telling it, making the connection between performance and the gear. And then we thought, well, we want to be able to get some of the fire station's addresses so we can send them information. But we want to do it in a way that felt natural and felt right. And so we're like, well, if we need to send them something. Well, in talking to our buyer personas, what we found out that what they want around the firehouse is just simple things like plates and coffee mugs. And so we did coffee mugs. And that's how we weaved it into our story of their life. So now there's a set of coffee mugs sitting in, in the fire station, right? And as they have their morning coffee, they'll be presented with the Lakeland logo. So again, we're finding ways to naturally tie our product messaging into the story of their lives. So how do you get some of this information? Here's a quick tip for you in terms of like if you, you're doing buyer persona research, a quick way to do focus group activity is Google a conference for your buyer persona. For, so for this example, I just did professional, I just did engineer conference 2016. Take a look at what the conference websites are saying. What words are they using? Because they're going after your buyer persona. They're trying to get them to make travel arrangements and to spend money to come to the conference. Right? So they've done some of this. Take a look at the messenger they're doing. 
Then take a look at the topics that, that they're talking about. What are the breakout sessions? We look at well, who are the keynote speakers? And do those keynote speakers have, a, are they an author? Do they write a book? Then we'll go to Amazon and take a look at those books and say, well, what other books did you buy related to this? And we'll read through the customer reviews. So we're using this all like a f focus group because people actually did something. They already made the action of buying a book. They spent money. So it must resonate with them in some way. So how do we leverage that? So what we'll do is a lot of times say, okay, well, they bought books of this topic, but well, we're not the experts to be talking about that. But we'll look and see like, well, maybe it's leadership development. That's one we could tackle. So we could partner with a local leadership development expert. Maybe we come up with a training series, a tip sheet, an ebook, whatever it is. But find some way to speak to them on the level that they want to be spoke to. So as we talk about the software, HubSpot, you've probably heard a lot about that at the conference. In addition to being able to create landing pages and conversion opportunities, there are other software that do it as well. HubSpot's a great one. But more importantly is once you get someone to convert on your website, it's the data behind it that we're interested in. You get the analytics to say so-and-so visited your pricing page or your case study page or your testimonials. Use that information so that your next communication piece is more relevant and contextual. So I have a secret for you that I'm glad there's only two people in the room that I'm telling this to. But when our sales pages, here's what we do. So if we have a qualified opportunity, what we're going to be doing is then we create a, a custom landing page for this prospect. We do a personalized video on that page. And when we, after we have the phone call, we'll send them information. And so we'll send them the link and say, hi, Jane. Great talking to you on the phone today. Here's some of that information we, we had talked about. Well, all I'm looking at is see is, did she, in fact, open the email? OK, yes, she did that. Did she go to the landing page that I created for her? If she didn't, I'm not worried about getting her to sign a contract. I'm just, my next step is just to keep communicating with her to get her to come to this landing page, because there's information on there that I want her to see. Then once I know if she's been to the landing page, I'll look at the video analytics and say, well, did she watch the video? And if so, how much did she watch? So I can, next time I jump on the phone, I have much more context on what she's done. If she's seen the full video, I'm not going to waste her time telling her everything about that was in the video. If she hasn't, I'll need to reiterate that. So how can you be incorporating video into your sales pages? Leverage tools like HubSpot. They've got HubSpot uh, marketing free that you can take advantage of. These all are tools that are, have a free version. So the, all the tools I'm talking about today have a free version. Hotjar. Here's a great one for heat mapping and video recording. So you don't have to guess how people are using your website. You can sit here and look at it, and you'll get heat maps on where their mouse is tracking, where they're clicking. They have scrolling heat maps, so you can see that if you have a call to action or a testimony or something important near the middle of your page and, and the data is telling you only 27% of the people are making it down there, you might want to test moving that up or try a different creative. Right? But we don't have to guess. They have video recordings. Right? So you can actually go there and you can watch people interact with your website. It is so creepy but so legal. It's two thumbs up. I actually asked the hot jar I said, is this stuff legal? Like, it's crazy. She's like, oh, yeah. But it's, you can literally see how people are using your website. You don't have to guess. They also have feedback polls that you can easily Im implement into your website. Now, I know people, some people think they're obnoxious. Whatever, that's your opinion, however you want to handle that. But it gives you the opportunity to, to combine quantitative data between your analytics, your heat maps, with qualitative data. Maybe just ask somebody what they feel. Did you find everything you're looking for on this page? They have conversion funnels, so you can start to see where people are dropping off. So in this example, it goes home page to pricing to registration, step one, two, and three. And you can see where people are dropping off. So spend your time where it matters. It's that old 80-20 rule. So go to the pages that, where the biggest drop off is and look and analyze that and say, well, what adjustments can we make just to get a boost in conversions? Wistia, we've talked about the importance of video. Wistia is a video hosting platform that in addition to be able to see how long people looked at your website, you can also get down to the contact record. So when I talk about our sales pages, this is essentially what we're looking at. I can see that an individual has, yes, gone to that page, and they've only watched a certain part of that video. Now, if you integrate with HubSpot, if Wistia and HubSpot, if you're using those tool sets and you integrate, you can run marketing automation and say, send email sequence one to people who've seen less than 25% of the video and send a different email sequence to people who have seen the whole video. And then maybe the, the sequence over here that didn't see the full video, maybe you're going to send them a shorter video of the stuff they missed. But my point is you, you have the data now to test and measure to see what you're doing if it's effective. We don't have to guess anymore. And we all know what measured 
what gets measured gets done. Databox is a great tool to be able to bring all your analytics into one dashboard. You can bring your Facebook analytics, you can bring your HubSpot, Wistia, whatever tools you use, if they have an integration, you can pull it all into one dashboard. Then you can do a data wall. So this is really cool in the office if you want to have some of your big KPIs for the entire team to see. So they can see it every single day being reinforced. Or more importantly, which we love is their mobile app. You can pull that in, you can, before you're walking into a client meeting or a, a, a in-person meeting, you can just quick take a peek and see, okay, how's traffic doing? How are, how are data from the CRM doing? You have all your analytics in the one dashboard. So lots of integrations with Databox. They continue to roll out more. I would recommend taking a look at it. It's a great way to just simplify your analytics and keep track of it. So what does all this mean? What can you do with today's information? What we encourage people is, is to strive for progress, not perfection. Okay, do your homework up front, do your buyer persona research, build a solid strategy, but don't spend 18 months on it. Do your best, get something out in the market, and then focus on continuous improvement. We tell you, let the data help drive your decisions, right? You don't have to wonder, just put something out there. Maybe you run a little paid media to it to get dry eyeballs. So let the data drive your decisions. But more importantly, you know, today at the, or this week at the conference, we heard about artificial intelligence, machine learning. We've heard about all that stuff. That's all awesome stuff, and we have to pay attention to it. But we can't forget we just need to be human. We need to be authentic. People want to know our story. Remember, they want to do business with people they know, like, and trust. Tell your story. There's probably somebody who's got a great personality in your office, in your office that needs to be in front of the camera. Because that's, if it's a salesperson, that's probably who people are buying into. Right? Don't be afraid to be human and be authentic. And I can guarantee you, if you do that, not only will your results be super, but you'll be super. So thank you, everyone.